The great cricketer is a Twitter stream. It's about playing crickets at the grade level. Boys! Get a few today, did you? To be honest with you, I um, hate grade cricket. <laughs> uh, I went into to play for a team called... Um, the name of Skid. Obviously, sharing's always a big issue, a big issue for, for young kids coming into a senior cricket team. It's taken like a win league. Um, a bit of advice for the player yeah. sort of one. I refer to the great cricketer here and I'll say, this will do a little bit early. (laughs) Hello and welcome to the Great Cricketer Podcast. Huge show. Oh, it's a huge show this week. We're previewing England and New Zealand. Ben, folks, has slipped on a sock. We're talking IPL restarts. We're talking monsoon seasons in India. Mornay Morkel is on the show. Our first South African guest. Mm. It's Sodi is on the show. Another skeleton hider. We love those Kiwis. Hashtag RCDC, and so much more all to come. This episode is brought to you by Budgie Smuggler, where you can use the code CHAMP to get free custom design on your Budgie Smugglers, your bucket hats, your accessories, etc. My name is Ian Higgins. Sam Perry sits across from me, and I him. Pezzy lad, hi. Hey, hi. Hi. Hey, hi. Hey, hi. Now, have you been catching all that's been happening in the world of cricket this week? Mate, <clears throat> contrary to your introduction, in the 52 weeks that comprise a year, this would have to be the week with the least amount of cricket, the least amount of big boy cricket especially going on. Now, I appreciate there's mm-hmm. county cricket streams. They exist. Yeah. But that aside. Marcus Harris scored some runs. Harry got some runs. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. Yep. As he should. As all Aussies should over in county cricket, really, because yeah, yeah, yeah. it's the 90s. Yeah, it's basically twos. But other than that, <laughs> other than that, <laughs> what am I looking at? We're looking at, what have we looked at online this week? Mums putting want, on 100 oh, with their sons. Oh, yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. NASA, Athers, oh, I don't know. NASA, Athers and Mark Butcher doing 20 minutes on the perils of blokes batting on off stump. Right. Yep. And someone's written a movie set in jail where the premise is that the term see a champ is a grotesque sexual, sexual slur. Right. Sexual slur? That's the premise. Right. Okay. I saw this. This was sent to us many times. I don't know too much more about this movie, but it was carried in Mm news.com.au. Veritable rag. (laughs) Veritable rag. Mm -hmm. And really, and and that was the hook for this movie set in jail. Okay. That it's a, you know, the idea was, it's actually a term of endearment set around the country. Wrong. What? But if it's said to you in jail, it carries sexual connotations. See a champ. Now, is that the fantasy of the writer or is that true? In what capacity can be you be champ? Can that be a sexual thing? I suppose we'll have to watch the movie. Don't genuinely don't know what it's called. I'm not hi- hiding that. But look, right. the point is, he goes. Yeah, what's the point? That's what's going on in cricket this mate, week, mate. Mate, that's it. Yeah. It's so m- can we comprise a show? It's <laughs> well, you've lined up some wonderful guests, and I'm looking forward to talking to Mornay mm-hmm. and Ish uh, as well. But I want to preview Pez. Finally, some fucking cricket is going to be about to be played. That's exciting. Yeah, I'm excited to see some actual cricket. You're telling me the West Indies and South Africa are going to play some test cricket as well. That's mm. exciting. It's all coming back. Are you are you hungry? Mate, I am voracious? so thirsty. Really? I'm thirsty for cricket. I'm not sure I am. I, I, are I you mean, not ready? No, I'll watch it. But I'm not like sitting on the edge of the seat with a with a half mask. Mate, you're wrong. Wait. wait. Well, it's just my feelings. I'm a, a, Your feelings, feelings are wrong. wrong. Yeah, I agree feelings can yeah. be wrong, actually, yeah. frankly. And you've chosen to feel that. Mm. Oh, cool. So you've become a bit of a cricket nuffy. <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing Colin at Lords. Okay, you think you'll get selected? Probably not, but he'll be there. Yeah, it's in the squad. Just the, just the camera shot. Just the camera shot. Yeah, yeah I'm looking forward thick, to seeing him as well. Those thick forearms on the balcony at Lords. Mm, mm. Oh, there's some history right there. Yeah, and the oval as well. Mm. Cricket True. oval, not the True. actual oval. Um, what's the series about, Pez? What's this England New Zealand series about? Like, what what is it? Because it feels to me a little bit like this isn't the main ticket. For both these teams. Obviously, New Zealand got their own thing in a couple of weeks' time against India. England have announced that all they care about is the Ashes, which I think is a really risky ploy. That's the only thing they care about this year. And But that at the same time, they feel it feels like both teams kind of need to win the series. Because if... Okay, England, right? England are putting all their eggs in the Ashes basket. Insane thing to do because they're going to get fucking pumped down here. Then if, when they lose that, they're going to be like, what was the point of that? We should have won some other games. So if they lose the games with leading up to it, then it was like, oh, this really was a waste of time. New Zealand, on the other hand, is wrapped up in this idea that like, what do New Zealand need to do to fucking be absolutely 
undisputed number one test team in the world, deserving of the test cricket ICC mace thing that they – is it still the mace? I don't know. Whatever it is. Whatever that trophy is. No, it's a trophy now. I saw the photo with Kane and um, Farad. With who? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Never do impressions. <laughs> um, so what's it about? So what's this series about? What is it? Hey, does it does it have to be about – does it have to be main event? Does it have to be a headliner? Sometimes you can go to a show and it's just a great fucking gig. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to be at a festival where, oh, are they playing the, are they playing the 9.30 p.m. slot? Are they, mm. are they on the main stage? Mm. Mm. Are they playing the Monday night at Blues and Roots, mm-hmm. Five Day Festival? It can just be a great fucking show. Well, test I matches, hope it's a show. Test matches are events in and of themselves. But I worry it's not going to be a show. It's but that's England only B. if we make it that way. I mean, th- this is, England is always a show. England playing Test cricket is always it's a, a show, show. It's regardless. A show. Yeah. Their show this time around is their preppers. They're prepping for the apocalypse. They've yeah. literally bought <laughs> everything from Coles yeah. or Tesco or mm-hmm. wherever it is because mm-hmm. the apocalypse is the ashes. Little. And players are products. <laughs> <laughs> so now they have a B team coming into this. I mean, it's not really a B team. They've got a lot of players. But it's still going to be a show in and of itself. And look, th- they're on a hiding to nothing, England. Although they're playing against the World Test Championship finalists, yeah. they still need to win, and they'll be expected to win. Yeah. And that doesn't make sense. doesn't make any it sense. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. If you accept that the World Test Championship is the apex of Test it's Cricket. the apex of Test Cricket. Where two teams play against each other in Southampton to work out who's the best in <laughs> Southampton conditions. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and India was always going to make it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But England's yeah. always a show, and I yeah. suppose the show this time around is, it looks like you're going to have two debutants at least in James Bracey and Ollie Robinson. Can yeah. they play? Yeah. There's some faces. There's some novelty. Yep. Ollie Robinson said this week that he's going to aim to get in the faces of New Zealanders. What does that mean? What does that mean in the cricket context? I don't know. Will you look at someone differently after you deliver the ball? Feels a bit headbutt the liney. I mean, if you've played the game, you know what it's like when someone's getting in your face or mm-hmm. you're in their face, mm-hmm. although you're not you're not technically in their face. No, not in it. <laughs> you're not, you're not, you're you not know the feeling of face. it. But when you read it from afar... You mm. wonder, what does that mean? Mm. I'm a highly trained and highly precise and attuned professional, but now somebody's told me that they're going to be in my face. You know when you're a bowler and then the yes. ball is hit back to you and then you, you get imbued with this sense of, oh, I will now embody the Hulk because the ball's yes. been hit back at me. I picked it up and I now must pretend to throw the ball back at him, although there is no chance of a run out, but I must intimidate at all times. And in the nets. Even though I'm basically Ronnie Arani bowling stump to stump with a keeper up to the stumps. And you're not suggesting Ollie Robinson is that. He's got some wheels, but not... He's got some wheels. He's had to answer questions about not being fast, as anyone who doesn't bowl 145 Ks an hour has to do now in Test Cricket. Mm -hmm. You you actually have to justify your existence in Test Cricket. And he made a good point this week that (laughs) there's guys who've bowled slower than me that can average 21 in Test Cricket. Mm -hmm. He's referring to Harold Larwood. (laughs) <laughs> no, I love it was quick apparently yeah. No, I know what you mean When you're playing cricket It's like If the ball's hit back to you Then the energy of that exchange Is all in a straight line yeah. And you must As yeah. in a rugby union game mm. Or whatever You must win the advantage line That's right Don't know what that means There's an imaginary line That mm. you must win It's got no bearing on the result Or yeah. the scorecard But there's all these intangibles going on And that's what it means To get in someone's face That's what I mean So when you walk back to your mark The batter goes He was in my face He's there my And, face I, and there. I don't like it He's got in my face Yeah Every bit of training I've had over the last 20 to 25 years yeah. from highly skilled coaches with, mm. with millions of dollars of resources poured into me is now under threat because someone got in my face. <laughs> <laughs> and I have not been trained for that. You know? She's <laughs> rattling someone. Steve Wall was right. <laughs> and then Wall James right. Bracey is going to play as well because Probably, Ben yeah. Folks slipped on a sock. Mate. He just slipped on a sock. Probably looked good doing it, of course. Would look really good. He's just slipped on a sock. And now James Brace is going to play. So, okay. I, I don't know. What's that? Like, first of all, my instinct with that is my instinct. My instinct mm-hmm. with that is my immediate reaction to and that. And this is, is a show about instinct, if nothing else. This is a show feel. about gut. <laughs> like George Bush used to say. It's not about science <laughs> or truth. Just what's your instinct on that? Now, watch this drive. <laughs> um, yeah, like Ben Folks was on the cusp of – he'd never played a test match in England, right? So that's, that's why right. his first game – in front of seven and a half thousand people at Lords, yep. every boy's dream, and and he, you know, like England don't really have a nailed down Test wicketkeeper. Butler, Bairstow's done it. Folks did a, he did a serviceable job in India when when everyone else struggled. He's probably England's second best bat, which is not that saying a lot, but still. And he's got a great opportunity against New Zealand yeah. to to put down a marker, fucking yeah. get him get himself 
make himself undroppable for the India series and then maybe lead into the Ashes as well. Well, it's New Zealand, so it's time to cash in, right? <laughs> New Zealand at home. <laughs> New Zealand at home. Mm. Easy pickings. Or prepping. Um, and he just slipped over and it's like, see you later. That's it. Yeah. And That's ha- your hammy, mate. Hamstring is like, what, minimum six. Well, I don't know how bad he, the tear is. I don't know what grade the yeah, tear is. Yeah, what grade is. was it? Put what it in grade, grade terms. <laughs> <laughs> Can you put that tear in grade terms? <laughs> Um, yeah, so I feel sorry for him. I feel sorry for him. Big but dumb. at the same time, pretty funny. Yeah. You so, can't help that. A slapstick injury. I played, um, actually, you know, you know, you know this guy. Um, and I don't know why I'm um, hiding his identity because it doesn't matter. But um, <laughs> he, uh, he missed uh, several weeks because um, he, he, uh, he twinged his back watching a One Tree Hill marathon. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> he was like lying on the couch in such a position. Then when he went to get up, he was like, fuck my back. He just cooked his back. Wow. One Tree Hill, what a show, to be fair. I remember the ads for that show. Chad Michael Murray. <laughs> so England's always a show. Uh, <laughs> Bracey's going to play. He's been coming at number three for Gloucestershire. He's averaging 47 this year. Yeah. Uh, so he gets a crack. Just another guy with a crack. I keep, I keep, I have Barney Rone, Rone's uh, mm-hmm. words ringing in my ear. He's like, who, who's our keeper? What's our team? What yeah. is it? Yeah. But that's England. That's what they're... That's, that's what, what they're doing. That's what they're about. Yeah. And then there's the whole thing about who's going to bowl for the England Test team. Yeah. Because Anderson's one test away from equaling Sir Alistair Cook's record of 100, 161 tests. Insane. That's fucking so many Insane, test matches. Insane. Um, but uh, but uh, he, he might not play because obviously Broad and Anderson will not play together. That's the thing now. And so Anderson has hardly bowled because there's been so much rain around uh, during his games, whereas Broad, I think Broad for Knotts has just fucking set the world afire. So, well, I was listening to Anderson on Tailenders. Uh, oh yeah, last week or this week, he said he feels fresh. He's like, I've I've, I've barely played, and that's good. So he's pretty keen. As you'd imagine, if you've played 160 tests, you've probably become used to being keen to play. You know, you're probably keen to play Test cricket, and you probably be yeah at the same time. So, so but at the same time, remember when Broad got dropped last year for the first Test against West Indies. Indies. And then he obviously took that really well. He was really calm about that. Nothing, there was no sort of fallout from that. Mm. And so he's been in red hot form for knots. Are they going to drop him first, or is Anderson going to get the breather? Well, I maybe mean, they'll play Anderson's both. Sp- maybe they'll play both. Of them. Anderson's played 160 Test matches, mm-hmm. and do you reckon if some fucking noob in a suit goes, mate, you're probably in a match fit, mate? I've got seven thousand Test wickets. Can you shut the fuck up and mm. let me bowl? I he's probably going to say that. Like he's closing in on a thousand uh, first class wickets. I think. I oh, sorry, uh, like a. They're like, what do you think about that? It's like, yeah, a thousand wickets does seem like a lot. <laughs> it does seem like a lot, doesn't he's it? He's good. I, I like him on talent. He's very dry. Yeah. He's, uh, yeah, he's funny. He's got that dry delivery that's just like, again, reflects having played 160 tests. Mm. He could just take anybody down. Mm. Just just Lancaster. He doesn't have to answer to anyone, mm. to anyone, yep. for anyone, including himself. Mm. I'll not answer for myself. Yeah, I'd like to see Broad and Anderson play. And then I think Ollie Robinson's going to play, and I think they should play a spinner. I think he should always play a spinner, really. Mm. When does it ever, you know, there's always talk about four quicks. So you play Leach? Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. Well, on the other side, um, New Zealand are going to play, well, they'll play Southie, Wagner, I'd imagine Jamison. Yeah. And probably Sandner, because Trent Bolt is in the squad, but he's actually still at home. He's in New Zealand. He was They've resting. said he's not going to play until World Test Championship. Okay, right. Yeah, okay. So he's not playing this series. Okay. They, they, he's, they've not deemed the series worthy enough, which is a great flex from New Zealand. Yeah. See, I'll accept that from New Zealand. Yep. In the circumstances. That's alpha. Yeah. How's England meant to feel about that? Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll rest. We'll hold Bolt back. This is, we're literally playing a tour game. New Zealand only play like three tests a year though. Mm. They're going to rest in for two of them. Good for them. <laughs> Good for yeah, them. Exactly. It's all, a, it's all an alpha showdown. And, and also he goes, uh, because of folks' injury, mm. um, they brought Haseeb Hamid into the squad as well. Yeah, right. So Haseeb Hamid, for, yeah, so those, for the uninitiated. Yeah, what's his story? Uh, worldly talent came into the side, the England Test side in 2016, made 82 on debut against India. Cole is like, this, this kid's a gun, yeah. unbelievable gun. Mm. And then he just went through the worst form and became the worst cricketer of all time. We all know the feeling. How good's cricket? Oh, it's like uh, just with him, uh, his test average went down to 10 couldn't bat anymore sort of thing. Absolutely no judgment of that. It, it, I'd imagine it'd be like, you know, getting in the bunker in golf. Here's some golf references. And it's like, like how am I going to get out of here? Mm. And you just don't get out. It's just mm. a nightmare. Oh, I'll just keep. And, yeah. and that, I think that was him. But he has now started to come good again, starting to look good. No one wants to go too hard on it, but he's averaging 50 in county championship. He's worked his way back. I like that story. Mm-hmm. I like when you can come from the absolute fiery depths of hell, the dungeon of form, 
where you don't, he didn't love cricket anymore. Absolutely. Why wouldn't you? Like, why would you? Mm. To be back in the squad, apparently an absolute gun, sparky, funny bloke. Mm. Love to see him do well. Um, it, there is, is there any worse feeling as a batsman where, like, you just can't score a run? And, like, you, you walk into the crease and you're like, I'll be out soon. Which is most people's careers, sure. And but you can't like, imagine it. You can't imagine, can't imagine it. it. You, people say, I don't know where the runs are coming from, but it truly feels like that. Yeah. It's just like, and, it, and it's, a, it's completely confusing. It's like, why are there some times I can go out and bat and I just know I'm going to score runs because that's just the rhythm that, of life right now. And then you go in mm. another time and you're like, man, I may as well, I, I may as well leave. I may as well kick yeah. them over. Is that- <laughs> <Just about> to- <laughs> what is that? that? I actually did that a few times. Yeah, the um, – the the idea I, I I think the idea for me was like that my hands my my arms were like shrunken I could never extend the I I was a fucking sitting duck I couldn't flurry there were no cut shots there were no like easy ones off the legs yeah. I was just sitting there with bat, basically without a bat yeah just standing there just like bolt stumps guys I'll just kick it or I'll knock them over or something I can't hit it I can't, can't hit see it, it. I when can't I, hit when it. I move my bat towards the ball it's yeah. not actually going to strike it yeah sometimes when I was batting I was like I want this to be over yeah because <laughs> because I'm, I'm getting my face you see exactly I'm. Did you ever have that? I'm going to get out soon. Oh fuck yeah, yeah. I'm going to get out soon. I, I had that especially, I think, as a junior, uh, or if I yeah. if I'd made an amount of runs that I wasn't used to making, it's like scaling a mountain. I've never gone this high. Now I don't know what to do. Mm. And you know, like when you look at that on the surface, it's silly. It's like you just cricket's just facing one ball. Yeah. But it's like yeah, but all of the context around where I am now is like I'm I'm higher up this skyscraper. I'm higher up a rung on a ladder than ever. Mm. Uh, I, I don't belong here. Mm. I must leave now. Mm. So just chip on a short cover and get out and, and, and walk <laughs> off. This is enough. This is me. This is my identity. Cricket, what a sport. What a sport. Uh, BJ Watling's going to retire. And then this is probably New Zealand's best ever wicket keeper. Neat. Looks good as a keeper. How keepers should be. Scored 205 against England in 2019. Okay. That's good. Yes. I, I, know, I feel like I know nothing about BJ Watling. He's the best of wiki keeper. And what does that say? It says more about him than me. <laughs> hey, Pez, the IPL is going to restart. Here's a quote that I, I think you'll enjoy. Uh, the Board of Cricket, the Board of Control for Cricket in India. On or the Saturday, Board of Cricket. <laughs> yeah, it might as well be. On Saturday, announced to complete the remaining matches of Vivo Indian Premier League 21 se- 2021 season in the UAE, considering the monsoon season in India in the months of September to October this year. That was the official statement. Read poorly by me. Considering the monsoons, the monsoon season in India in the months of September to October this year, so that's the reason they can't play cricket in India. Then yep, I don't see an issue with that. All good. Well, all good. You famously don't play cricket during monsoon season. It's a very sensible decision. That's actually the same here. In the BCCI. It's actually the same here. Yeah. 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 It's the it's the wet season. It's monsoon season, mm. and uh, that's why you move it internationally. There's no other reasons. So gonna- why do they do this? He goes. That is 101 gaslighting. Yeah. It's just considering monsoon season. No, guys, that's not why. Why Why do you say that? Is, I mean, perhaps there are technical broadcast contractual reasons to simply suggest another reason well, than a ravaging pandemic. Surely they're saying that because they want to keep the World Cup. In India, which is which is also like Dada has said, he's going to ask he's going to ask the the ICC for more time. In fact, what's the date today? Yeah, he's going to ask them today, June one. Um, that he's going to ask them for more time before they make a decision on where the World Cup is going to be played. So the 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 idea is it's going to also be moved to the UAE, and that starts in uh, I want to say November, I think, um, or maybe end of October. October, October yeah. Uh, but they want to keep it in India, and the reasons they want to keep it in India, there's like a tax thing with the ICC. I don't involve. <laughs> yeah. I don't fuck. I don't know what's going on, but I'll speak about it publicly. Um, and so I think they don't want to acknowledge that COVID exists because if they say that, oh, because of the COVID situation, then it'd be like, well, we're not going to play the World Cup there. Then they're like fucking desperate to keep the World Cup in India, but it's like. COVID's never been worse anywhere else in the world in the entirety of this pandemic than India right now. Ah, monsoon season, eh? Mm. It's, it's wet. Yeah. Bit of rain around. I just use monsoon season for anything I want to get out of. <laughs> Can't come in today. Yeah. Ah, it's monsoon season. Ah, monsoon season. Bit yeah. wet out there. Ah, uh, yeah. Anyway, man. so they're going to play the UAE. They're going to, they're going to, sorry, the tournament's been moved to the UAE. It's going to restart in the third week of September. There's 31 matches to be played. They're likely going to play, uh, I think it's 10 double headers in the space of the three. They're going to play the, Rest of the IP on a three week window, ten double headers in that time, jam it all in, and then I guess the World Cup will start after that. It makes so much more sense if you're gonna just keep everyone in the UAE because mm. and then also um 
Uh, they're, they're also the IPL are telling the CPL to like start their tournament earlier. Yeah, so it's yeah, now yeah. moving that kind of Got stuff around. for someone. Of course. And then Nick Hockley, who's obviously just been announced as the uh, um, permanent CEO of, um, of, Ast- of the um, – Cricket Australia. Thank you. Uh, he has said that Australian player IPL availability is yet to be discussed. Now we'll be playing that. <laughs> well, I noticed, uh, you know, insofar as the BCCI must every week attempt to alpha somebody um, – uh, had some comments made about them by Mark Butcher on the Wisdom Cricket Podcast yep. when he was just like, he was sort of being contrarian about the idea that the ECB had stood firm to keep their five tests. So for those who were kind of catching up, the BCCI made an informal request to the ECB that they only play four tests this summer, not five, yeah. to accommodate the IPL scheduling that they want. And the ECB, surprisingly, stood up to the BCCI and said, no, we're keeping five. Mm. Actually, Darren, Giles Darren, put his foot down. Darren from Soliol need to keep his tickets. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the oval test, uh, or the old Trafford te- test, actually will remain. Um, Butcher made this point that, like, for once in the history of, or well, at least the last decade or two of cricket, now an administration would have had leverage over the BCCI. Ah, oh, Indian cricket, you want something, do you? You want something from us? Mm-hmm. How about as a quid pro quo? And I'm mm-hmm. paraphrasing Butch here, mm-hmm. my mate Butch. Yes. How about as a quid pro quo? Yes. All right. We'll accommodate that. Four tests in England, but in uh, exchange, you give us Coley, Dhoni, whoever we want to play the 100 for the next three oh, years. Oh, shit. You make yourself available. So why don't we quid pro quo that, bitch? It's not what they would have said. No. I think. Maybe in an email. Uh, he just wondered whether it was an opportunity loss. He also put out there that they may well have suggested that. We don't know. He's speculating wildly about what they're doing in the I halls like of power. I like that. But there was a kind of contrary point made that it would have, that, you know, the England cricket fraternity are so, they've had so many progressive ideas sold to them at the moment they've been asked to buy into. Could they accept another one mm. in the rank and file mm. of losing a test match in the summer to accommodate the IPL? They already have to accommodate the IPL so much. Mm. Anyway, it turns out the ACB did not allow themselves to be offered by India in this context. Now, will they go missing? <laughs> will they be found under a bridge? We, we'll wait and see. But uh, I don't really care, mate. The sporting world is a dystopian Biff's Casino alternate world at the moment while COVID happens. Mm. Everything seems to ride off. The 100 seems to ride off. Overseas players can barely go now. It's fucking had everything go against it. Mm. I don't know. Yeah, Just want to watch some cricket, eh? Well, mate, that's exactly it. And the fact that's even a talking point uh, to this extent is just says, that, like, can someone just fucking play some games of cricket? It's like the, cr- the cricket stopped. It, it has to stop. I know mm. because, like, the this is the IPL window – Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. I understand all that, but it's just, it's remarkable when like when there's this gap in the calendar, and obviously the 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 outlier as well as in Australia have actually just stopped playing cricket. They just don't play anymore. They don't play. Um, uh, and when obviously when only three teams play, and then one of those teams does not play anymore, it does it does sort of stand out like a, re- a sore thumb? But um, Malcolm Conn wrote this piece about Nick Hockley. He goes, yeah, oh, well, it wasn't about Hockley. Malcolm Conn, who's the chief cricket writer at the Sydney Morning Herald, formerly head of comms at New South Wales Cricket, New South Wales. Yeah, that's right. So he's. He's been, and before that, a, a story journal as yep. well. So he spent some time inside the belly of the beast. Yeah. He went inside the tent, pissed out, as they say. Now he's outside oh. pissing in. He's been in both. He's walked in both worlds. Now he's pissing in his tent. He's pissing in his tent, but that's a separate <laughs> issue he needs to address. That's a no. private thing we said we wouldn't discuss Malcolm's on has been very helpful for the great cricketer. Uh, and that was a figure of speech about the pissing stuff. <laughs> um, it's not even true of him in any way. Just the, a, the, just more, a, the more you talk about it, the more it's a you're butchered lying. bit of language. Yep. Uh, but he wrote a very interesting piece over the weekend uh, about the general dearth of leadership in, cric- in Australian yeah, cricket. Yeah, yeah. He spared Tim Payne from yeah. it, but he said basically at every other level, mm. there's there's conjecture, there's inconsistency, mm. there's um, instability. And he mentioned that you know Justin Langer seems to be on the nose. It's it's understood that you know he's. The renewal of his contract is subject to how he performs, which is pretty much how life should be for everybody. Mm. Um, that Nick Hockley at the time of writing was the uh, was an impermanent interim. and inter- interim CEO, mm. and that Earl Eddings, uh, the chairman of Cricket Australia, is seeking a second term, which is something not even Sir Donald Bradman could achieve. Mm. Uh, and I thought it was a good piece in drawing together a lot of the um, a lot of issues going on in Cricket Australia at the moment, of which they dealt with one by making Hockley permanent CEO. We don't know much about Hockley, but we did text. The flax at CA and say, listen, if he wants to come in for a charm offensive listen. Into, into TGC Towers, yeah. he's very welcome. Give the code a go. Yeah. We'll give him a crack. Yeah. We'll get him sitting here. I'm sure he's used to Jolly Mont, but he can come in he can come <laughs> into the grade cricket. He can come studios. to us. He can come to us. Yeah, yeah. 
He won't at all. <laughs> <laughs> once uh, once the lockdown's over, obviously. Yeah. But yeah. uh, so we look forward to speaking to him. They, they they were they were warm to it. They said, "Yeah, let's get it going." So yeah, we'll meet Nick Hockley. Yeah, it's interesting. I just want I just want the team that I support to go and play some games as well, which they will in a moment's mm. time. They go to the West Indies, but then uh, that obviously the. It was yesterday when the players got out of quarantine. The guys who just come home from the IPL, we saw some images of like Pat Cummins um, being embraced by his pregnant wife. Fiance. They, they married? No, the uh, fiance. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, like Dave Warner's obviously got three young daughters at home. Um, Steve Smith's shadow batting in the hotel with bats. You know, he's got his own thing going on. Mate, there's some serious fucking. I don't know if anyone else has seen this, but it's like uh, Danny's partner put up. Mm. Images of him shadow batting, but he put a towel over his head. Mm. Real Abu Ghraib energy to it. <laughs> it did look like a hostage. The, you know, like it's yeah. like, inst- you know, it's a, uh, yeah. I forget what you call that thing when you just see an image and you respond to it straight away. And uh, like for, it's a psychiatry oh, exercise. Oh yeah, yeah. What do you see? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. As soon as I saw it, my first thought was it just reminded me of like cause some of the Abu Ghraib torture stuff. <laughs> Except he was Don't just, know if anyone else thought that. <laughs> except he was just trying to figure out which, which New Balance sticks are the best pickup. Uh, uh, yeah, same. He ranked them one to eight. But Although they're, saying they're all that, pretty good. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I bet they're all fucking really good sticks. Yeah. yeah. Now, this one's actually cashmere. Mm. Uh, they're saying that I did see uh, Cheshwa Pajara on Instagram wearing his uh, oh, yeah. his India kit, for his India shirt for yeah. World Test Championship, yeah. and he's also shadow batting in his hotel room. So. Just leaving it. Just yeah. Yeah, him. yeah, yeah, yeah. He wasn't playing a flourishing cover drive. Like that. I, I saw that. I don't know if anyone else caught this, but it was India kind of revealing its kit for the World Test Championship final. Yeah. And the big thing you notice is that the word, you know, the name India is splashed across the front of the kit. Like Again, a one-day shirt. You know, white's becoming gradually vandalised. Yeah. Yep. Says me, the purist. But I thought it was interesting. It was a kit reveal. And like, who would have thought 20 years ago? I mean, you get a kit reveal in Premier League where you get the third kit, the th- the, the alternate kit, the fucking away kit or yep. whatever. Yep. And some of them are fake kits and stuff and yep. you get them early. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, who would have thought that cricket could find a way to do kit reveals for whites? <laughs> <laughs> well, but they have. As I said to you yesterday, Pez, I won't be happy until, until a test match playing whites and actually club cricket playing whites are turned into essentially like racing car jumpsuits with just fucking 85 sponsors all over Exactly. <laughs> Partridge with his Castro jacket, <laughs> but for test cricket. <laughs> Tim Bain going out to the ashes with Joe Root, flipping yeah. the coin, their blazers, Castro on the back. I can't wait till Tess White's become Excel so cool mobile. that I buy them, you know, as merchandise and yeah. wear them as a really cool normal person whose hard drives <laughs> don't need to be checked <laughs> at all. <laughs> can't wait. But that day will come. Maybe numbers and numbers on the back. Maybe that'll do it. I can recognise them better with the numbers. <laughs> oh, 65. I'm going, okay, that's Morkel. <laughs> Morning, Morkel, and this show coming up. But Pez, none of this, of course, would be possible without our dear, dear friends at Budgie Smuggler, where you can use the code CHAMP for free custom design. Custom design, normally 50 quid, on normally you. 100 bucks. Not bad. Yeah, coming into summer in the UK, seeing some sunnier photos as well. So that's for you over there. What mm-hmm. would you want to put on your custom designs? Well, we're talking about names and numbers. Do you have a number? Do you have you a number? What, your phone number? Yeah. <laughs> Put in your phone number. You've lost. Yeah. <laughs> Please call. <laughs> you know, with like the fake kits we are just talking about that you see with like Premier League ones, and they somehow like attach like a, a tag to it, but they're the fake, you know, like mm. a like a, like a a barcode tag yeah. with a price on it. Like yeah. who goes to these extreme lengths? And also like it's obviously so fake because you can't even buy it yet. So why is it being like sold as if it's in a retail store, yeah. which it ain't? I remember my mate bought an Arsenal kit once and uh, he was sort of like, he was sort of rubbing it in my face somehow. I don't know why. Look what I got. And, and I could like, I could tell that it was just horrific because it, the, the actual Premier League badge was sewed on badly. Right. And also the Premier League badge was gold, which you only got if you won the title, <laughs> which they <laughs> okay. had not done. Right. Okay. And he hadn't picked that up. Right. Okay. Anyway, I'm just talking about once offering a guy and uh, explaining that badly. You know, um, <clears throat> I hate, I don't know about you, but back in the day when I was like, you know, getting up to watch Liverpool, my team, the Premier League, for mm. instance, and you get up at unusual, unusual, the fucking insane hours. When you have that opportunity in your life, when you're like in your early 20s, maybe late teens, mm. and it's like, oh, yeah, 2 a.m. for fucking Blackpool away. Yeah, go on there. Definitely yeah. watching that. Got plenty else on. And what I used to do was used to like put on my Liverpool kit, 
like <laughs> full kit of boots. Wow. <laughs> boots, no. Oh, that's a disclosure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, put a put on the shirt, you know, support the team. And then I was like... I want someone to get a close-up of my eyes just then as he said that. <laughs> just my like, dilated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shin pads, yeah. boots, oh, yeah, okay. tape mutt, just some knee strapping. Mm-hmm. Um, Denko rub. And then... <laughs> Apartment just reeked of tiger balm. <laughs> um, and then I was dating this girl at the time. And then she oh, was, God. And, and then she was like, yeah, 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 it was a fetish. Yeah. No, uh, she, um, she said, why do you do that? <laughs> I didn't have an answer. You should have married her. Yeah. <laughs> You've always said that. Uh, yes, that's budgie smuggler. Uh, budgie smuggler. Yeah. Look, uh, one thing you can do with custom designs as well is, uh, treat them. That's budgie smuggler. <laughs> is, um, maybe if you're looking for a gateway to tattoos. You know what I mean? <laughs> what? Well, you can custom design something that you might you think you know. I'm, I'd oh, like to get I that see. tattooed on me one one yeah, day. Okay. I made got a tattoo the other day mm-hmm. on one arm on these triceps. It said "Got Soul," and then the other arm "Not a Soldier." Nice. You know, a little bit of a paraphrase. It's a ki- killers lyric. Killers, yeah. Yeah. He, he should have tried that on a hat first, I reckon. Yeah, or um, even even a henna tattoo. Mm. Whatever happened to the band Tattoo? Oh, dude. Well, there's a podcast called Red Scare. Yeah. And uh, that's their like that's their opening track. Red Scare Belgrave. Belgrave. <laughs> In London. <laughs> Belgravia. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and um, Red Scare Belgrave. That's funny. Uh, well, yeah, that, they've got this podcast. And every time I turn it on mm. to listen to it, that track comes on. And I have to stop not listening to the podcast and listen to that whole track because it's, it's just such a banger. Yeah, it just gets song. me going. Yeah. Really gets me going. Mm-hmm. Anyway, perhaps you want to put the girls from Tattoo on your uh, – in terms of a marketing like ploy, it's like, yeah, okay, this song, but two girls kissing. So mm. what do you think about that? Mm. Bunce. That's the great Bill Hicks bit about the best piece of marketing you could do. What? It's just a – I'm going to paraphrase this again, but it'll just be a woman sitting sp- with legs spread with yeah. her fingers between her legs, and, yeah. it, and then the, the sign just comes up saying, drink Coke. <laughs> okay. That's it. Yeah. Okay, just, I'll do that yeah. then. Yeah. Just do it, but yeah. Here's a song, but just have two girls kissing in it. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah. All right. Oh, yeah. more people watch it. Yeah, here's $10 billion. Mm. Yeah. Budgiesmuggler.com. Here's Mornay Morkel. <laughs> okay, some numbers to commence with. Here goes this man. Looking down the screen at this man. He played 86 tests, 309 wickets at 27. Best of six for 23 in an innings. Eight five for us. There's a nine for us there as well, which, which we'll talk about. Uh, 235 wickets in uh, white ball cricket at 25 across both formats. 566 first class wickets at 25 and 25 as uh, we respect him massively in this country. I think I'll speak for all Australians. Yeah, and I'll do. often do that. Yeah. Mainly because he was big and fast and he made us afraid. <laughs> and, and, and that's the language that we speak. <laughs> we speak that language here. <laughs> Uh, he also texted earlier today saying he was nervous about this interview. Uh, so, Mornay, <laughs> the warmest of welcomes to the great cricketer, mate. And um, why are you nervous? I don't know. I don't know what to expect. Um, obviously, I, I've heard quite a lot of good things about this podcast and this chat. But uh, um, you, never, you never know what to expect. But uh, thank you very much for that great introduction. I was, you know, it was my job to do a drum roll. I don't know what I was supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> most yeah, most of the guys just correct us on any statistical inaccuracies, yeah, you know. But yeah. um, let 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 me, let me start where we always start, Mourne, and and this is the premise of the show. So somewhere around the start of this year, I, I saw a link to a YouTube clip titled "Mourne Morkel Highlights versus Sutherland First Grade <laughs> Round 14 2020 2021." Yeah. For those who are listening, Sutherland is a Sydney grade cricket club, and I thought, yep, I'll click that. And uh, it's four and a half minutes of you terrorising <laughs> Sutherland's first grade batsman. Um, so what's your relationship to club or grade cricket and how did you find the Sydney experience in particular? Yeah, let me just say that this was just before the IPL auction, you know, because I don't play with it. Oh, you know, so I paid the guys actually a bit of money under the table. So listen, just post a video of me looking good. Uh, and then if I get picked up, we can, we can sort something out. So... Uh, you know, they did a great job with the video, but unfortunately, they didn't get picked up in the auction, which, uh, you know, sucks. But, um, yeah, it started sort of my journey with club cricket, great cricket, cricket started about, about a year and a half ago. Um, and I moved moved from from South Africa to, to Australia and um, I was playing my cricket in, in, in the UK. And, yeah, I, ne- I needed to get some overs under my belt before the start of the UK season. And um, sort of just rocked up at training at Manly one day and, you know, um, said I'm available to play. And 
you know, yeah, from there sort of kick started and um, what a what a club to be involved with, mm-hmm. I must say. You know, awesome facilities, great bunch bunch of guys, and uh, um, yeah, just kicked on from there. Did, mm. When you when you say you just rocked up to training, did you did you literally just turn up at Manly Oval <laughs> unannounced and and ask if you could have a game? Can I have a bowl? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I basically just rocked up and uh, I said, guys, you know, I've got a couple of weeks before before the start of the UK season. I actually did first before that. I went to 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 the east, the to the New South Wales, you know, to train with the Blues, mm-hmm. and um, just my luck. That was the day that uh, David Warner and Steve Smith. That was their first day back at training, and on that day, I rocked up to train. So you can imagine <laughs> the media of <laughs> the, the old Sam Bigger. Okay, so here's Warner now rocking up at <laughs> the Blues training. <laughs> Warner running to them with the nets, and I'm like, no, I need to find a place you know I can hide and be more sort of you know <laughs> do my Thing. Um, but yeah, so journey started then and um, played now sort of a handful of games for Manly, which was, which was awesome. Yeah. Obviously, some of the best cricket you've ever played in yeah. your life as probably well probably across high, your career. Highest standard, probably. A really high standard. It is a good standard, but I must say, they sell the games, you know, on, on a Saturday very well to me. They said, Morno, please come. You know, don't worry, you won't have to bowl many overs. We're looking to get up 12 to 15 overs max out of you. And uh, every time I take this cherry and I, I rock up on a Saturday and I'm bowling like 25 overs or 20 <laughs> overs. So, uh, you know, this year, this coming season, I'll have to, to have a better selling point, but um, it's good fun. Like I said, it's, it's a good standard. And for me, you know, growing up as a youngster, um, we only played six to eight school games a year. So it was, mm. it was very, it was crucial for me to play cup cricket. And, and, you know, for me, it was a great standard. And that's where my, my, my games, game sort of grow and develops. So to come back here and give back a little bit to cricket and help youngsters on the field, learn the game and to share a bit of knowledge, knowledge is awesome. As obviously now, and we sort of want to go back to the earlier part in your life, uh, Mornay, and, and learn about there. And I, I understand that you used to live with your brother, Albie and AB de Villiers at one time in, in Pretoria. And I, I want to know first of all when was that, and also like was was AB like the perfect roommate? Do you know did he pay did he pay his rent on time even early actually in advance? You know was he good at mm. FIFA? Did he cook and clean, mm. or was he the kind of guy that you have to sort of report to flatmatefinder.com because he watches you sleeping as a pet snake? <laughs> so once yeah once I got kicked out of the house, um, you know signed a, a rookie contract to to play with the Titans, and we had a power team. You know we mm. uh, AB was there, Faf was there. We had a, a really awesome team, and. Um, yeah, so me, my brother, my brother, and Albie, we we moved in together, and you know that this you can just imagine. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was good. It was good fun. It was good fun. You know, yeah. I can't. I won't be. I won't be able to share a lot of the stories. We'll keep that <laughs> why, for why, why? you know, even, evening around a fire. Once, uh, you know, or evening around a fire. But um, yeah, I just, it just. I think that the the thing about the the whole sort of the three years we lived together was, um, you know, you you live, breathe and sleep sport so yeah. on the weekend it's either watching the Springboks play the all blacks or the wallabies or you know we, 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 we go and play golf or you go for a run in the morning or you, you go you know gym so that, i think that was a nice environment for me as a youngster mm. to grow up in a house like that where we all one always pushed each other and two it was it was sport crazy yeah. and living with ab ab was you know he was, he was the prince of Victoria, so it was nice <laughs> to live with the king um you know to drive with him in the car and and go to restaurants and go to to pubs and stuff like that it is it is a great experience and yeah. you know to grow un, un, although we're the same age but age to be under his wing and um yeah sort of start my my journey uh was great yeah i don't, I don't know if this is mythology Mornay, but uh Go with it, even if, if you like it. But the, <laughs> the, is it true that there's a story from the early days that you you bowled to when you were young? You bowled to Jacques Callis in the nets in Pretoria, uh, and he just asked who you, who you were and got you in the South Africa team pretty soon after. True, very true. Um, so just to to rewind to that story, so Ray Jennings, um, when I made my first first class team, I played for was uh, was Easterns, and Ray Jennings was the was the coach at the time, and um, yeah, uh, Ray, Ray eventually became the coach of the, the national team and uh, England was touring South Africa uh, and they wanted some tall bowlers to bowl at the nets because, you know, with Halmerson and Flintoff and all those guys were, were coming mm. to South Africa. So, yeah, I bowled the, the, that afternoon to Jacques and um, so, yeah, something just clicked and bowled quite well to him. And, yeah, after the net, he walked, he walked sort of over and introduced himself and said to, to, to Ray that I must play in this test match starting on Thursday, which was for me was like, wow, you know, it was uh, 
from an, you know, 21 years old, face covered in pimples, didn't know what was going on in world life. And now you've got the legend of Jacques Cullis, you know, coming first of all and, you know, talking to you, which was awesome. So I ended up that test match just sort of, sort of being like a, a 15th man, like a sort of just in the change room, helping out if guys needed to, to want to, if they wanted to go hit balls, I would always be like a net bowler, bowl to them. And yeah, what an awesome sort of five days to, to see what it's like, you know, to be international cricketer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, well, you played in probably one of the strongest ever South African teams. You guys had the ICC test mace for number one, mace, test, yeah. the, the mace for, for like three years between 2012 and 15, I think it was. And you guys won heaps of series away as well, which is obviously that's becoming rarer and rarer in, in test cricket now around the world. But I mean, like what, yeah. what in that team, you know, Amla, Faf was playing, you were in there, uh, Dale Stain, Graham Smith was a captain, obviously. Yes. AB, yeah, he's a good player. Um, you know, like who was, was there sort of like one leader which brought everyone together or was there one sort of jokester which everyone sort of got around or what was the sort of environment of that team during those years when you guys were the best team in the world? Um, yeah, I always, always, I love talking about this. I think one of the, you know, the strengths of that team was we had a core of, of, of great senior players, mm. real leaders, Jock Callis, uh, Graham Smith, um, you know, Hashim, and, and everybody sort of played their part or did their role in a different sort of way. Um, you know, Bauchi was the guy that, you know, if we needed a, a kick up the arse, he would be the, the guy that said, listen, boys, that's not good enough. Graham's people skills are, you know, how to get the best out of people was 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 amazing. And then Jacques just, you know, being Jacques was he was just a legend. And um so the team back then was basically, you know, it was run by them. Um, mm. you know, the coach was he was just sort of a guy in the background making sure training and everything was well organized. But those guys, you know, playing under their, their wing was, was 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 amazing. You know, they stepped up when times were tough, um, really fronted up. I mean, coming here in 2008 and back in 2012, you know, it was massive for us to, to sort of start a reputation to to win, you know, away from home. Mm. And I think you know, two series against India, which has never been done before, we actually came close to winning that series. Mm. Um, first time beating Australia in the backyard, England back home. So, um yeah, it was that and just a, a great sort of, you know, getting a, a, a sort of identity of the team. You know, what, what is the Proteus? What does South Africa really stand for? And we spent heaps and heaps of hours. We actually locked our cricket bags away, went on, on camps and really discovering our identity for the Proteus. And, mm. you know, the first, for the first time, I mean, I always talk about you know, playing for your country is great, but what, did it, what does it really mean? And there was real meaning behind, you know, playing for the Proteus. And that's where the whole Proteus fire thing started. You know, the first thing to re- regenerate after a felt fire was as a Proteus. And we took that sort of onto the field, no matter what it gets thrown at us as a team with politics, with you know, outside interference, the Protea will be the thing that will always regenerate. And we became a real sort of power, powerful brand on and off the field just by living up to those things daily. Mm, that's a, it's an unbelievable team. I think you guys um, took over England's number one ranking. You beat them and then you came to Australia and then you defended the crown uh, and you yeah. won that series there. I mean, and you and you would have seen some of the, the best innings you would have played with and against some of the best ever players, seen some of the great innings. But what are your memories of Rob Quiney's nine at the Gabber in 2012? I think he played, he played a beautiful pull shot of me the first <laughs> first three balls. Um, luckily, I played I played with, with Bobby uh, at Rajasthan, so we were very close mates. Yeah. So um, play eventually test match, the test match at it against him was was awesome. You know, I think he's still the funniest man going around in world cricket, and uh, yeah, um, yeah, it was awesome. But um, I also remember, I think if, even if you look at the the YouTube clip now. It, you know the commentator. I think it's Slat who says it's the best nine they've ever seen in their life. And uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean Bobby. Obviously, I mean, in a way, as a mate, you wanted him to do well. Yeah. But uh, you know, it was it was great to to sort of get put our pick in the ground and really kick kickstart that test series of well. And and you're talking there about playing in the IPL. I think you played you played three different teams. Is that right in the IPL? So I played for Rajasthan, Delhi, and Kolkata. K- KKR, that's right, yeah. And in 2014, you won with KKR, and I think you were the best bowler that year for KKR. And we've, we've heard stories in that, in that year about, you know, great partying and, and the gift-giving that KKR celebrated the team's success with. I mean, can you, t- can you tell us about the circuit afterwards winning winning the IPL that year? Um, 
yeah, so I mean, the IPL is it's, it's it's honestly a tough gig. I mean, you, mm. you the games finish late, and it's always like a like an after party or a sponsor function that you need to attend. Mm. Um, you know, I think as a as an international player, I wouldn't say you're forced, but you you need to go show your face. So after doing six to eight weeks of that, you know, playing back to back games, um, you know, doing functions. I mean, some of those places, some of the you know the the after party functions are sort of underground. So next thing you'll sit there and you'll look at your watch and it's like you know five in the morning and you it feels it feels quite weird to sit there with a, a whiskey in your hand at five in the morning other people having breakfast so um <laughs> yeah. it, it is quite hard but um yeah i must say it, it is it's it's an incredible experience you know to um yeah, sit, sit in those sort of functions and connect with players uh, uh, you know, across the world. I think you know, there was always a bit of tension when South Africa played Australia or you know England, but um, you know the IPL sort of broke all those sort, mm. of, sort of differences that there was. I mean, I remember the one year we played um, Australia at the, at the Wanderers, and you know after the test match, we all got into one bus and we were on the bus driving back to the hotel. I mean, never in the world would you, you know, back in the day, would you would you see that? It just shows you, like, you know, the quality or the power of the game and how it can actually unite, flipping, you know, all of us. Yeah. yeah. Just speaking of the Australian South Africa there, Mornay, it's a, that's an amazing yarn. I'd love to know what happens on that bus trip as well. But... <laughs> uh, it always it always strikes us here. I think that South Africa is you know holds so many similar values to Australia, particularly in the way we play cricket. Like, uh, which is which is what was what makes for such fiery series. It's like mm. a Springfield Shelbyville thing in a lot of ways. You know, <laughs> like it's just we're just looking at alphas of a, on a different side of the world yeah. going up against each other. I mean, did you guys? see it the same way i know there are cultural differences but and different contexts and histories but is that the, a correct observation that both sides just sort of seem to go about their cricket in the same way and every time you play against each other it's just literally who has the biggest swing in dick <laughs> i love that yeah no for sure <laughs> that's uh that's uh, a great way to put it but i you know i think for us um you know the reason why we we became successful in Australia was um, you know the guys just figured out in the past like this so much sort of adrenaline so much media hype so much sort of things that go into a test match that you know teams really used to struggle um, you know keeping up with with the Australian team for three four five days you know they'll they'll compete for day two day three and just because of the constant pressure, the crowds, I mean, back in South Africa, you don't have really guys abusing you. You've got, you play at the MCG, you've got 10,000 people that, you know, abusing you non, you know, like nonstop. And eventually you reach a breaking point. So we, we sort of really put a point on it that say that, okay, come day three, four, five, where it really counts, you know, how can we, can we step up and compete and not sort of fade away? And um, that was a focus point for us, you know, when we ever, we felt under the pump and they were, they were sort of, you know, getting the upper hand is that, you know, somebody put their hand up and we said, no, fuck that. We're going to fight back. Are we going to stand up? You know, and if the crowd abuses, us, it's, it's fine. And eventually we started to get that confidence. Eventually you start winning a session and eventually you start building or something and then you win a test match. And, it's amazing how quickly then the crowd turns. I mean, we played a, the, the, the test match there in, in Perth and, you know, chasing 403 and, you know, the crowd were flipping against us. And then AB and, and Jacques Callas, they, had a, they started having a partnership and, mm. you know, I think JP Germany came in and mm. the crowd was eventually, they turned so quickly and then they were next thing abusing the Aussies. So that was our game plan, just to flip and hang in there, you know, because things can change quite quickly. And then the media all of a sudden is off our backs. They're focusing now on, you know, the coach, the captain, this guy, that guy. And then, then, it's, then it's sort of not plain sailing, but then you're sort of in, in control. And then after that, because you guys had a, had a really good series win the last time the two test match, uh, the teams played against each other in 2018. I'm not sure if you remember that series, Mornay. Mm. Um, but... Um, I just I just want to know everything about Durban in 2018. You know, it's just, it's tea time. You know, you know, Davy and Quinton are going at it, and uh, I don't really care about that. But I want to know everything about Faf Duplice coming out in the towel. That's all I want to know about. Please. I want to know where you were. I want to know what you were thinking. Does Faf conduct all his team talks naked? You know, can mm. you tell us everything about that exchange in the Durban stairwell? Look, if you if you type in Faf Duplice in Google, ninety five percent of all the photos will, will be with Faf without a shirt. <laughs> You know, his pants slowly, slightly drops so you can see the V shape. So he's got a he's got a body. He, he works he works hard on that body. Diet, 
gym and you know he's got the rig so yeah. mm. um there's no excuse so, like he doesn't need an excuse to take his shirt off and i yeah. think you know we're always sort of getting ready to go out for lunch that day and you know Faf was he was obviously Durban is, is famous that time of the year for being sort of humidity is quite high so yeah. sticky and sweaty and yeah. you know like i said he was Probably did probably a couple of setups or you know a call cool session before just before lunch, but <laughs> heard the commotion uh, outside and yeah, I mean he's also he's also one of those guys he's not he, he, he won't stand back you know yeah. he's, he's up, always up up and yeah. I thought you know he sort of ran out and uh, yeah sort of just wanted to be the the bouncer the big brother. <laughs> Well, no, there's, there's a great story in Australian folklore, like cricket history, that uh, about the day Bradman was bowled for naught in his last test, thereby yeah, denying yeah. him the uh, the average of 100, mm. uh, the test average of 100. And then Arthur Morris, who was part of that setup, would, would often be asked where he was that day, what his memories of that were, and he'd say I was up the other end yeah. hitting 196. Um, <laughs> in the same vein, just... Um, with that, uh, with that famous test in Newlands in 2018, which will always be known for sandpaper, uh, you took nine far and finished man of the match. Um, what does that mean to you? And can you can you take us into the South African sheds after Cape Town? Like I, I can only imagine it was just champagne celebrations, yeah. and again, faff in a towel, or maybe the towels <laughs> removed. Towels, towels are still definitely on. Um, <laughs> yeah, but uh, yes, I just tell you what, I was. Um, I'll never forget. So we just sort of got off the field and in our change room, we've got like blow up mattresses where the bowlers can have like a 20 minute sleep, just part of the recovery, or you can just lie down, you know, and um, the TV was sort of on and I was just snoozing away. And um, you can hear when you lie and you snooze, you can hear when there's a wicket, you're like, there's this, this, like the crowd will like, oh, well, there's a yeah. boundary. You can yeah. hear the chair. And there was just a different sort of, different sort of noise. You know, so while I was sort of dozing away, and I'm like, "What is going on here?" So my one eye just um, sort of glanced at the TV, and you know, next thing was it was they showed it on 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 on, on a telly, and then you know, our flipping entire change room also sort of exploded, and because we obviously saw yeah. you know, Cameron putting the, the the sandpaper down his down his pants, and the crowd was just like going up, you know, like shot him because they showed it on the big screen, and they were like, "No, nah, it's down his pants and his eyes pants," so. It was it was 10, 15 minutes of, of chaos, and um, yeah, I mean after that, you know, as a team, if something like that happens, you know, you've got the upper hand. So it was important for us then and there to to you know really stamp our, our, our foot on the authority or like you know, take it down. And um, he didn't have to say anything. I think he just he just stared a guy, and, <laughs> and they knew that you know that yeah. was that was the case. So, but um, yeah. Great day of cricket for me personally, taking taking um, sort of nine wickets and you know second second last this match playing for South Africa to walk away with the man of a match achievement was was quite special. Uh, but yeah, like I said, the, that this match will be remembered for a lot of other things. <laughs> so, so basically, the takeaway is Mornay Morkel slept through sandpaper, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kept an eye on it, kept an eye, but it's just having a kip. Yeah, yeah, I was just having a snooze, and then <laughs> there we go. It's on. <laughs> there's this uh, there's this great thing with sandpaper Mornay where like a, you know it's it's obvious a bunch of people know the truth you know about what happened but there's this like omerta code of silence you know like a mafioso style yeah. and um, you, you you guys will definitely know what the approach was with the broadcasters you know highlighting Australia's use like I, I guess what I'm asking is uh, you know are you excited to release a book at some point highlighting what happened from South yeah. Australia's uh, South Australia South Africa's perspective. <laughs> No, 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 no. I think, you know, that's the story is done and dealt with. It's got a, enough attention. Um, you know, I think it's it's time to time to move on. You know, I've got I've got no real story to tell. Um well, you, you were know, asleep. I think I think <laughs> eh? you were asleep. <laughs> you were asleep. <laughs> yeah, I was asleep. I was I don't know what's going on. So um yeah, no they they've paid they've paid paid the price. I mean life is life moves on and you know, yeah, so no story to tell to tell from my side. There's um there's there's great uh, there's great great history for Australia at Cape Town because in 12, 2011 um Australia got bowled out for forty seven there mm. uh, when they were nine for yeah. twenty one I mean like it, uh, South Africa just must love playing uh, Australia <laughs> at Cape Town because something always goes down there. Mm. <laughs> uh, it is a fortress. I mean that that test match. Oh, I mean how was that? You know we got bowled out and as a as a bowling unit we were like oh we're back in the field. You know mm. they're probably going to bat now for a day and a half. Um, and yeah, we flipping managed to get one or two early wickets, and you know Vernon was was in fine form that day, 
and yeah, bowling out for 42. I don't yeah. think anybody can would imagine that. Uh, yeah. Um, you probably roll your eyes. We've just returned to sandpaper again. Um, <laughs> there's so much like uh, what well, one thing that we hear so far because a semi serious question about it. This, like when we hear about sandpaper now and people are trying to work through it, and we agree with you. We've said this before. You know, I don't even think the public has much of an appetite to even go back into it that much. It's just that there are so many things we don't know and that are unsaid, and the cover up's worse than the crime and all that kind of stuff. But one thing you keep hearing is that like, look, you know. Every team had a ball management system. You know, it's that great euphemism. Every team was doing something, right? And, like, so then people are starting to suggest, well, maybe there should be an amnesty and every player from other teams come together in a big 60-minute production that mm. Mike Atherton hosts where mm. we all talk about the way we manage the ball. Hands Tell across the world. Hands across the world. <laughs> it's just, yeah, like the 1980s singing a song. <laughs> singing a song for yeah. AIDS, yeah. But, like, uh, is, is that um, – and that's one way people try and explain to the average, Joe Average that, like, everyone was doing something at that time, you know? And I suppose my question to you is, without having to uh, ask you how you guys did it, <laughs> is that is that fair to say? Like, everyone had a way? They caught us in Australia. I mean, you know, Fuff was on Channel 9 with a lolly in his mouth. So um, all our, all our trades was exposed early on, you know. AB with a glove, Vernon with a zipper. You know, we've tried every trick in the book. Um, but- <laughs> <laughs> That's just it. <laughs> yeah, we, got, we, we we didn't go that extreme with, with sandpaper. Nah, yeah, I yeah. mean, but yeah, I think every every team definitely, in a way, you know, they have a story to tell. Um, but let's let's wait and see for that day. <laughs> also, <laughs> we all come <laughs> yeah. But also, uh, obviously, Mona, you you now you know uh, living in Australia. Mm-hmm. You know, you're married to Roz. Obviously, Australians will know Roz very well. Uh, but I mean, how satisfying was it? There was Australia who sort of copped the brunt. Yeah, look, it's, it's a tricky <laughs> to answer <laughs> because, uh, um, you know, I'm, yeah. Now, look, to be honest, um, it was, it was satisfying, to be honest. I mean, just, <laughs> you, you think, you know, and I'm, I'm talking, I'm talking, I'm talking from a, from a team sort of perspective, yeah. you know, uh, we, we've, we've come here to Australia for years and, yeah. you know, the, abuse and the amount of stuff that happened on and off the field you know there, there was it was it was tough it wasn't yeah. easy yeah. um you know i think sometimes as a as a, as a cricket team you, you think that yes you know i wish the tables can turn can can something just happen that yeah, can yeah. just you know level the playing field a little bit yeah and you know that was like it's like a movie the day that happened everybody was just like boom here you go <laughs> <laughs> have that um but yeah, I mean to see it then from there escalate and go to the matches that it did. Yeah. Um, you know, that was that was wow, like Crazy, you know, yeah. this is quite scary. Because mm. like I said, I mean we Faf got caught mm. in South Africa, uh, over in Australia, mm. you know, and got the demerit points, we moved on from that match band. But to see Australia then go, you know, what the way they did, it was it was like Jeepers, okay. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's this is there's bigger things at stake here now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And when Faf got caught, like Steve Smith came out and said, no, we do the same thing, except that when like Bancroft got caught, I didn't hear anything from Faf. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, uh, hey. uh, maybe, maybe you must get Faf on to come and explain that. But uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. But can you ask him or we've asked, we've asked everybody else <laughs> if we can get him on. Hey, um, Mornay, anything else from you? Mate, yeah, mate, thanks so much. Great, great. Uh, and very generous. Thanks so much for chatting with us. And, um, you know, if people are going to be hanging out for those YouTube clips of Mornay Morkel versus Northern Districts just terrorising <laughs> more 19-year-olds uh, <laughs> with short of a length bowling going past their face. Oh, awesome. Guys, thank you so much. Hashtag Ask TGC. Pez, as you know, hashtag Ask TGC Fridays every week. We've had some great questions coming in over the last little while. That's at patreon.com forward slash great cricketer. We do that show every single week. Really enjoying those. And, uh, you know, with the people in the UK getting right, they're getting their teeth stuck into the cricket season there. Mm. Uh, you know, many, many uh, confusing elements of life will be tossed up over and over again. So get those questions in. And if you want to get around us, patreon.com forward slash great cricketer, that support has, um, has kept us going through this entire pandemic. So, um, and just use Ask TGC, whether it's here on the show or on Patreon, just as a writing exercise. I mean, if you want to just work on flourish, mm. just really creative flourish in your writing, if you want to overwrite things, yeah. if you want to test out a few uh, techniques, a bit. if, if you want to overwrite some stuff, if you want to try and 
crowbar some personal achievements into a story, yeah, often. which ends up becoming about your personal achievements, yeah. do it. Yeah. If you like getting roasted, mm. it's just a good reason, a good way to practice your writing skills. And everyone knows yeah. deep down we need to develop our writing skills, especially yeah. in this digital age. Of course. Cheers. Of course. Uh, a couple of these are from Patreon, actually, but, uh, but we can bring them out here. Alison Stock says, Boys, I had a dream last night in which I was on all fours and Vrat Coley was sitting on my back gleefully taking a selfie. This isn't really an RTDC, but it's an image I can't get out of my head, so I thought I'd put it in yours. Good point. Thanks, Alison. No, yes. no question there. I just uh, thought I'd read that out. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean? Well, I, I get, yeah, the first line had me um, paying attention. I had a dream <laughs> last night in which I was on all fours and Virat Kohli yep. was sitting on my back. Yep. Okay, taking a selfie. Taking a well, selfie. I mean, that to, to me, that's just a, that's emblematic or um, a metaphor for the power of the BCC on the in, in, in Indian cricket, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, no, I think we've, in many ways, we've all had that dream, <laughs> haven't we? Let us know. I well, I, I've had the dream where I'm on all fours and Virat Kohli sitting on my back. <laughs> and I've enjoyed it. Yeah. Frankly, <laughs> it's quite light. Yeah. Would you let that happen? Yeah. yeah. What, if that meant we could interview him? No. No, just, just so you go to ask for an interview with the BCCI. I don't even know who to go to there. Yeah. And you request an interview with Virat Kohli. Say, this is a great cricketer, blah, blah, blah. This is yep. where we're on the charts and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all yeah. good. You call, you call up base SCI, you say, can, can I speak the data? Can we have, can we have 15 minutes with Virat Kohli? Really fun, mm. lighthearted sort of chat. And they get back and go, uh, what we can offer you is mm. you can get on all fours and he can sit on your back and take a selfie. Yep. Yes, I'd say yes yeah, to I'd that. Yeah, I'd say yes Just to that Just for as the well. story. And uh, you can't talk to him. He doesn't talk to you. Do you, get, do you get the photo? Are you in the photo of his selfie? It's not, it's a selfie. It's just, he, so you don't even see. He just posts that, but you'll know when he posts it. You can, see, on a your bit back. Of your, you can see a bit of your lower back. Okay. That's Is my shirt riding up so you can see the skin on my back? No. Just my shirt. Just a little bit of it, yeah. Can you see the whether I'm in shape or not? Or is it? No. No, no idea whether this guy's got a rig. No. So you could say to people, your grandson, your granddaughter later, it's like, that's me. That's my back. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't be showing many people, I don't think. Oh, I was... Virat Kohli's one from my back. I've not washed my back since. <laughs> That's the great Virat. Just really strange situation. I asked for an interview and yeah. the BCCI said no, but no, he will give but, you this. Yeah. You taking that still? He doesn't talk to you. Doesn't say a single word. Doesn't address you. Yeah. I'm taking it, man. What about you're already on all fours? Yeah. Where am I? Uh, in my mind, it's in the BCCI, which in my mind is like, like a, it's a castle. In my mind, it's in your apartment. <laughs> Okay. He walks in with a few minders. Yep. Are we ready to go here, guys? Yeah. And you're on all fours and he just sits on your back. What about if you were blindfolded? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I say, are you saying you take away one of my senses yes, to I enjoy am. it? Yeah. No, no, no. You're not enjoying it. You're enjoying that less because you can't even see it. That's what I mean. You're removing one of my senses. Yes. Well, I mean, in many ways, wouldn't that amplify the remaining senses? That's what they say. I can feel his ass on my back much better. <laughs> But you will never have, you won't have that memory because you won't have ever seen it. You, you'll, 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 you can still remember things if you don't see it. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I know. remember blackness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Will I remember the feeling, the sense, the mm. sensation of mm. his. Will it be ass? as special to you? What is he wearing? A robe. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> the velvet of his robe. <laughs> On my. <laughs> On my AS colour t shirt. Is it summer or winter? It's spring. Spring. So I'm probably where it was what city? Melbourne. I'm R- probably still wearing a jumper. Venice. Oh, so it's probably some sun. I'm probably wearing a t shirt. I could even pull off a singlet. It means it's thinner fabric, so I can feel that velvet <laughs> much better. Thanks for the question, Alison. I hope that helps. Thanks, I hope that helps. <laughs> I think we've all had that dream. Nick314 <laughs> writes in, hashtag ask TGC. Try on again, am I? For what favour did Don Rahane owe it to the dark side of New Zealand cricket <laughs> to arrange for folks to slip on some socks, inverted commas, and could it shed new light on the Joffre fish tank incident? And can you background that? Do you know what the fish tank inc- incident is? It's his injury that he um, sustained while uh, engaging with a fish tank. He b- cut his hand on glass. I don't um, remember that. Mm. It happened though. It happened. That's not that's not the thing that I remember Joffre missing games for. It's when he went he popped down mm. to Southampton last year. Yeah, he's missed he's missed games for many reasons. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't to see Chris Jordan. Mm. <laughs> that's what I remember. It was in Brighton, wasn't he? Or something this, like that. The fish tank incident was reasonably recent. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
He's cut his hand. There's just been so much cricket recently. I just, I just have. But, but this is this is Nick three one four's point. Just yes. oh, Joffre had a fish tank incident. Oh, okay, that seems normal. Ben folks slipped on a sock. All right. Oh yes. Move Th- on. Things are happening. Yeah. Things are happening. And he's things making a point, as as we've pointed out, that yeah. there is a certain mafioso quality to a jinky Rahane, or as Nick three one four calls him, Don Rahane. It makes sense if India were in any way involved in these matches. So India will get no benefit with Ben folks missing games. Well, he's one. He's asking. Obviously, Don Rahane owed something to New Zealand. Oh, I see. Because he's doing it for New Zealand. So, so what's the, what did he owe New Zealand? So one of the players is going to wake up with a horse's head in their bed. Perhaps New Zealand. Yeah, I'm not sure what what he may have owed New Zealand to actually have to pull that off. Does anyone owe New Zealand anything? A thank you for the wonderful, you know, um, Hobbit movies. We owe them a thank you. Just just refuse to extend that country any respect <laughs> because of our insecurity. The other day I was seeing images of yeah. um, their Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern and Scott Morrison exchange mm. a, a mm. Maori greeting, mm. head to head, nose to nose. Yeah. Fuck, there's a contrast there. Yeah, Jesus. Yeah, I know. Uh, Jacinda Ardern was standing next to Scott Morrison, mm. quite tall, presidential. She's, she's nearly as tall as him. Really? Yeah. How tall is she? How tall is he? Well, he's a, he's 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 Probably big. He's a, he's a big. Yeah, he'd be big six foot. He's a big boy. Is he? Morris. Yeah, they're all fucking big. These guys. Are they? I say that bitterly. Yeah, all the fucking politicians. They're massive. That's a broad sweeping statement. All politicians are massive. And you know when I say massive, in this, and they've worn a sense thickness. Mm. Go fucking show show me a politician or any executive or any person at the top of public life that yeah. doesn't have a thickness to their body, and I'll show you a liar. But. It, are you saying that because you're looking at a two-dimensional screen where, like, then you see them in real life and no, it's like, oh, it's a fully formed body? No. And I I'll give you athletes. I'll give you athletes. I'll turn up with this next week. I'm going to find you multiple reviews out of esteemed universities confirming that there is a correlation between uh, high office in public life and size, physical size. Really? Do you know that Margaret Thatcher had vocal lessons uh, to deepen her voice for when she was uh, really? prime minister? because it conveyed a certain gravitas. Thickness and depth is everything. Mm. And I'm just showing, Jacinda Ardern has it in spades. Not super popular, Thatcher. Well, it depends among whom. <laughs> yeah, it really does, yeah. A yeah. couple of terms, though. John Howard wasn't a tall guy. I bet the hands are thick. Yeah. I fucking bet you. Mark Latham. Oh, well, he ruined his entire <laughs> career off the back of a handshake. One he handshake. went too far. <laughs> One handshake. <laughs> All right, Pez, last one. Last one. Okay. Uh, we're jumping in here. Here we go. So, uh, Michael Leach. Boys! G'day, Pez. And here goes one of your Kiwi listeners here. I'm writing in to ask your opinion on a very hotly debate- debated topic within my group of mates, one that some of us call the fraudulent hat trick. We played in our school's T20 cricket side. To put this into context, we're all now far past our school days and thrive off our successful professional cricket mate getting us cricket nuffies free tickets to New Zealand domestic games. <laughs> Okay. Thrive off. <laughs> the game at hand occurred in 2016 and has been a divisive topic in our group since. By the time of our story, the game was all but over after we posted 180 odd brackets 120 and had our opponents around 7 for 60. Our mate who took the fraudulent hat trick came up to bowl his over and had probably not bowled a ball on the pitch, let alone on the wickets, the whole season. Fucking hell. How bad can people be? That's fuck. Well, why would you play? Okay, maybe don't let the truth get in the way of good yarn kind of thing. I mean, surely. Why would you play where well, you cannot land a ball on the fucking wickets? I'm getting angry. Yeah. All these fucking thick talk. Like, that can't be true. First ball, a ball as far outside of off stump as Stephen Harmison's first ball of the 0607 Ashes test. Nonetheless, the batsman somehow gets to it and manages to snick one behind to the keeper. Second ball, a pie that almost had more height than length. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> what? Um, the batsman charges down the wicket and the ball somehow manages to hit leg stump. Now, this is where the controversial element comes in. Mm. The opposition team captain came over to us, presumably after this wicket, and said, one of our players had to leave. Do you want to call it there? He obviously had better places to be than play low-level school cricket on a Saturday afternoon. With the prospect of a hat-trick, the adrenaline got the better of us, not knowing the horrors and controversy that would haunt our friend group for years to come. We replied with, nah, mate, we don't mind if you want to keep going. Just send another batter out for the last wicket. 
The captain tells the batter who has just got out and coming off the pitch with his head down to go back out and bat. He begrudgingly accepts and he's on strike for the hat-trick ball. Inverted commas, hat-trick ball. Mm -hmm. Needless to say, the wicket fell and somehow our mate had managed to get one of the most outstanding but also incredibly sad hat-tricks ever seen by man. The questions for you lads are, does this fraudulent hat-trick not count because it was the same batsman and the game should have in fact ended before that? Is it more impressive that our mate managed to get the same batsman out twice or that we played in such a low level of cricket that he could have batted twice? We'd love to settle this dispute after five years of civil war. Cheers, Leachy. He goes. Yep. Um, doesn't count. Go on. Um, the hat trick itself. Okay, here, here's why you need to get three separate batsmen out. Go on. Because... <laughs> Thank you. Because to defeat a batsman, three separate batsmen is to defeat their techniques, their skills, their abilities, three separate people. You've already proven that you can get out the second guy. You've already shown that. You've already exhibited that. It's an actual disgrace that this guy has got out twice in two balls to the same bowler who bowls it with more height than length, (laughs) which is fucking really funny. And also the pace of that, if you bowl it that high, the pace of that suggests for it to be actually hitting the stump still, then obviously so slow that it has not bounced over the stumps. Like how like how slow that actually has to be. I'd strike that from mattering in terms of whether this hat trick counts or not. He got the cunt out. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And I understand that, yeah. yeah. I'm just saying, but it's a disgrace for this guy to get out twice and two balls to the same guy at that level. Like what, like what is this cricket? That aside... Oh, well, yeah. We the, need the, to point the, out the, the cricket le- sounds shit. Yeah. But it doesn't count. You can't get out the same batsman twice. It's, it's that, that's actually the same as a team hat trick. Not a hat trick. You can't you can't include one of the dismissed batsmen as a run out because you do not you do not deceive you do not trick you do not defeat the batsman in that moment. I think the answer to this question really depends on where you land on the autism spectrum. <laughs> yep. Law twenty five deals with retirement in cricket. Mm-hmm. If a batter is ill or injured, they are considered retired, not out, and may be able to return to batting if they recover by the end of the innings. However, this second guy was out. Mm. He's out. He's dead. He's dead. He, he doesn't exist Comes in the dead. game. He's gone to the great gig in the sky, mm-hmm. cricketing, in cricketing terms. He's persona non grata. Mm. The, the game became a sham. All the r- r- wickets beforehand, they're all wickets. They count. Mm. They count, mate. doesn't matter how shit it is. It's a, hat, a hat trick. It's a hat trick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, we point out that the cricket's shit because we need to do that. Yeah. For our own purposes. That's right. Okay? But that's about us. The game became a sham when he was invited back in. It's a sham game. Mm. Shamsy. However, I want Shamsy. <laughs> <laughs> just wonder with your with the legal mind though, he goes. I, I yeah. look at that from a black and white legal perspective. Sure. It's like the, the game ceased to become a legal game of cricket. Okay. It became a fucking backyard game. It yeah. became barbecue shit. Yeah. Like, it became Shamsy. Yeah, it became Shamsy. Yep. But I wonder from a legal perspective, if you could, if you could put your legal hat on. Yeah. Bigger, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Upon agreeing to come back in, yeah. did the did the game, once there was agreement between both teams about oh, how I the see. game would proceed. I see, yeah. Including the batter, who was consensual, who was consenting. Yeah, he consented. The ca- both captains consented. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if there's provisions with this for this within the MCC laws. Yeah. But once both captains agreed in the way um, – no, no, sorry, mm. no. It's not like – once both captains agreed to play on, did the game um, legally and morally, you know, take on meaning? As in, as in if they'd gone on to play and let's say this poor batter had been dismissed yep. twice in a row, which is the fucking saddest thing I've ever read in Fuck, my life. It's fucking sad. Um. No, he shouldn't play again. But um, if he'd gone and score 100, do you take that 100 away from him? Here's exactly the point, Pez, because the game was now entirely confected to create this hat-trick scenario because, and I quote, the uh, opposition team captain came over to us and said, one of our players had to leave. Do you want to call it there? The game is over. They have, they have, they have accepted defeat of the game. But and yet so extended now, the invitation to the other side yes, to agree. Yes, but to your point, well... What would have happened if they, if this guy had then gone and scored 100 and they had won the game? 
would the other team have been like, oh, that doesn't really count. So the entire game is now confected to create this moment where like he can get a hat trick because that's the only reason that, that that's the only reason that they've continued to play that this guy's on a hat trick. The game is over. Do you want to try and get a hat trick? I'll oh, put the same guy back in. Not even not even rotate the striker. Yeah, that's what I would have thought. Do you want to try and get this out this guy out again? But if it wasn't, so, how so fucking he, so bad got, is that guy? Because what I'm trying to imagine is the, the conversations that are taking place in this civil war. Yeah. Because his friends are doing the right thing and denying him the opportunity of enjoying a hat trick because this bloke can't fucking play. Mm. He can't land him. Yeah. And he's got a hat trick. And, the, and yeah. his friends, helpfully, are, yeah. are still denying him the opportunity to enjoy it. Anything bad could happen to this guy in his life yep. and his family. Yeah. And his friends would be doing the right thing by saying, no, mate. Doesn't count. If you compare what he did to an actual hat trick where you yeah. get dismissed three separate batters yep. in a live game that's recorded on scores mm-hmm. and scores mm. recorded in and put it on the match. internet and it's on the internet so it's true. Uh, I know which hat trick I'd prefer. I know which one's real, mm. which one isn't. Exactly. And yet, both teams agreed to continue the game. Mm. If it wasn't a hat trick, what was it? Was it nothing? Did nothing happen? Was it a tree falling in the woods? I mean, they they completed the act. I want to look at the scorebook. And you, you don't recognize anything else that happened. Yeah, scorebook. Yeah. And yet it happened. This is oral history we're reading. This is data with a soul. Stories are data with a soul. It's not a hat trick. The question is, is it a hat trick? It's not a hat trick. What was it then? A wonderful memory. It was a lie. <laughs> it was a lie. Son's got a creative mind. That didn't happen. Sweep it under the carpet. This is some dumb shit that's ruining the fabric of the game. Sorry. No, well done. <laughs> nah, well done. Thanks to Morno Morkel. Thanks to Wish Sodi. Thanks to you guys out there on the internet. We'll see you guys finally with some cricket to talk about next week. See you then.